Welcome to The Drill Down. We've got the business stories behind stocks and a move. I'm Corey Johnson with episode number 244. Well, just ahead, pager duty, friend of the show, but not a friend to its shareholders. We will dig into the latest quarter from that company. And Encino taking banks online and sending its own stock flying. And a fascinating conversation with a company that could finally bring relief to those afflicted with lupus and even multiple sclerosis. It's a novel treatment. We're going to talk to the CEO of Caverna Therapeutics, the CEO's named Peter Mag. Fascinating conversation. But first, it's sponsor time. The Drill Down is brought to you by Braintrust, a global talent network that matches highly skilled technical freelancers with the world's most reputable brands. Brain Trust has helped clients like Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Porsche, Under Armour, and more build agile tech teams fast at a fraction of the cost. Visit Braintrust.com, that's B-R-A-I-N-T-R-U-S-T.com to learn more and get 20% off if you use our link, Braintrust.com slash drill down. Part of Futurum's Chief Market Strategist, Corey Johnson. Welcome to the Drill Down, where we explain the business stories behind some stocks and a move. Joining me as always, Ben Wilson on the turntables. You do everything else. So- <laughs> Something like turntables, not quite turntables. I still use a keyboard, but that works for I me. I assumed you edit this thing with like scissors and scotch tape and the, the reel to reel. No? <laughs> no, you got that absolutely right. That's what I'm doing. So, Corey, what stocks are you drilling down on today? Well, I want to start with a, an interesting company called Encino. Encino, spelled differently than you'd think it'd be spelled too. It's N. Yeah, not like the fine film uh, Encino Man with, uh, starring Brendan Fraser. You know, that funny enough, one. I was thinking about that. <laughs> uh, lowercase n, capital C, Encino. It trades with the ticker Encino, N-C-N-O, with a market cap of about $4 billion. Shares were up 17% in the last week, but for the last 12 months, shares are up 59%. So what's the story with Encino? Did I ever tell you about my hanging out with Brendan Fraser? Uh, you know what? Somehow that story hasn't made it down the pipe. I'd love to hear well, it. Yeah, I wrote, a, I wrote a profile for him about him uh, when he was first coming up in uh, Rolling Stone and ended up hanging out, spinning a... Very long night hanging out with him in Manhattan a long time ago. Great guy. Anyway, nice. uh, but Encino is a cloud-based banking company uh, and a, a fascinating one. Uh, this, the origin story is great here. Uh, this started with the inside of a bank when they were trying to fix some problems at a bank, tired of the old like, kind of MS-DOS approach to uh, 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 onboarding clients and bringing them into um, – you know, all the financial products that they could be involved, the clients could be involved in. They realized the, the the value of the software is probably greater than the value of the bank. So they spun this thing out. It's kind of like Salesforce, but for banks. And so it, it's, it's kind of, the you know, allowing customers to come into a bank and, and, and have deposit opening, analytics compliance, loan origination, client onboarding, all that stuff. Uh, and kind of a modern software way, and it's working. It's working well. Subscription revenue product, just like Salesforce, and uh, the revenue uh, for the quarter about 124 million dollars to give you a size of the business, but up 13 percent when they reported their most recent quarter. Subscriptions up even higher, and that's their main business, up 16 percent, suggesting great things for the future. I think that's why the stock was up so much. But uh, what's really interesting here is is kind of what's happening in the um, ecosystem of banks, large and small, and where they are in terms of uh, risking new software and trying to change the way they do things. The, the great thing about being in the, the business of supplying banks is that they don't change their customers much. The hard thing about being in the business of supplying banks is they don't change their customers much. They stick with the way they do things for the longest periods of time. So once you can get in, you're in. But for now, uh, and, you know, uh, they were having trouble getting in with banks, but that's no longer the case. Here's the CEO, Pierre Nod. I would say that uh, the, the larger banks is returning to more of a strategic posture, which means they are beginning to look at lots of transformations. It's very early on in the buying cycle, but most of the actual activity is on the non-loan origination or non-commercial loan origination systems, okay? So it sinks other than commercial loan origination. And as we always reminded you, we see our customer base as a massive asset to this company. And, you know, you can see now how we're beginning to cross-sell into them with existing products as these products start scaling and become more attractive to larger banks as well, as well as the community and regional space. You can also see how the Doc Fox acquisitions will be tremendously accretive to those accounts. Uh, that is a critical issue for them, how to deposit account opening and onboarding with a robust KYC and AML functionality. Um, so I think we are proving out the case that our customer base is not a drag, but actually a positive for us. 
So bigger banks looking at transformations. That's good for Encino. We got to get these guys on the show, Ben. Just a fascinating company. I, I would love to hear them on the show sometime. Corey, what is your next drill down? I want to look at pager duty, friend of the show. Pager duty, friend of the show indeed. Trades with the ticker PD with a market cap of about two billion. Shares are down two percent in the last week, but for the last twelve months, shares are down thirty percent. So, what's the story of pager duty? Yeah, uh, uh, reporting a quarter that was really disappointing to investors. Uh, so, friend of the show, maybe not friend to its existing shareholders. Um, although they're trying, Jennifer Tejada, the CEO there, was kind enough to come to the Drill Down podcast. About, what was it about a month ago? Maybe Ben? No, it was actually yeah, it was pretty recent. That. But in any case, um, they reported fourth quarter revenues uh, and full year guidance, and it just wasn't that strong. In particular, the billings came in weak. Now, they did have some strong growth in customers, but the weakness in the small to medium sized businesses. Pager duty, uh, for those of you uh, scoring at home or those of you alone, uh, they, they've got a, a facility that sort of helps um, uh, let companies know how the, well their software is working and how they can make their software work better within a corporation. Um, and it lets them move faster to, uh, you know, their customers move faster to, to fix problems when they pop up um, and alerting them to, to, you know, things that aren't working in software. Um, uh, hence the name Pager, right? Well, it alerts their customers to what's going wrong. And uh, all on a software uh, stack, of course. So uh, their guidance is kind of weak. But uh, in listening to a conference call, listening to Jennifer Tejada, again, a bias because she was kind enough to come in the show. And I thought that she was a fascinating uh, executive. But I heard all these kind of green shoots, this suggestion that there were things that might go well for them, even though the guidance was, was uh, summarily brought down. Here's Jennifer Tejada. From a leading indicator perspective, large deal pipeline has improved dramatically. Conversion rates are back to where they were, you know, pre the macro dislocation. And like I said, we're seeing an increase in both multi-product deals, so operations cloud deals, as well as multi-year deals, kind of underscored by that RPO um, growing by 30, over 30 percent. You know, we also, when I when I look across. Um, what needs to happen in this next year. We're not relying on the macro to improve. And in fact, there's upside. If we were able to uh, attack federal um, more like sooner than you know, we currently have in plan, uh, if generative AI uptake were to come up on mainstream faster, we see that as a use case that drives more complexity, more software proliferation, and therefore more incidents. Or if the macro were to improve, those are all tailwinds we're not factoring in to guidance today. So maybe that's just uh, trying to gussy up some results that weren't that strong. Uh, but I, you know, it was interesting to hear that there were some things that could get better for this company. And maybe even the hint of her voice suggesting they're already getting better, even as they're bringing the guidance down. Corey, what's your next drill down? Let's take a look at the chip maker Micron, Micron Technology. Micron Technology trades with the ticker MU with a market cap of about 131 billion. Shares are up 23% in the last week, and in the last 12 months, shares have basically doubled. So, what's the story with Micron? So, uh, a fantastic quarter. Well, actually, a good quarter. Second quarter earnings um, uh, reported uh, last week, and and I thought it was taking a worth taking a deeper look at what was going on here because, you know, the entire semiconductor sector is excited about AI, but in the midst of a slump around mobile phone sales number one and PC sales number two. So, mobile phone sales, uh, particularly in China, have been really weak. Um, an extended slump there. And then PC sales, uh, during COVID, during the during the lockdown, a lot of people bought new computers and upgraded their, their home situations, whether it was through their co companies or personally. But that big bust led to a, a, some sort of time off from spending from the, in the PC business. So we're watching what's going on uh, in with Micron because we want to see if people are going to start they're gonna, uh, ordering new chips, if companies are going to start ordering chips, suggesting they expect a return of, of smartphone sales, and of PC sales, and both those things look like they've turned around. The worm has turned for Micron. Uh, their sales are 58% year over year to $5.8 billion, uh, profitable quarter. But 58% revenue growth uh, is just fantastic for a business that was shrinking six months ago. Um, and so the worm has turned there, and it's really all about DRAM, their, their, their dynamic ra uh, random active memory. Um, uh, that's up you know, fantastically. Um, again, after uh, declines previous uh, to this this quarter, I guess last quarter was up a little bit, but really big increase this quarter. So it really shows that the that the cycle has turned here. Um, and a big reason for that might be AI, not just the orders 
uh, for PCs going forward. Uh, AI systems, particularly high bandwidth memory, HBM, high bandwidth memory uh, is so important in data centers um, and, and for powering AI. And uh, while it's still DRAM, uh, high bandwidth memory is particularly suited for those needs. Here's what Micron's technology CEO, Sanjay Mahortra, uh, had to say about HBM demand. We are sold out for our calendar year 24 uh, supply and our calendar year 25 supply is also uh, mostly, vast majority is uh, already allocated. Uh, we, are, uh, we have just begun production shipments and these will continue to increase through the course of calendar year 24, as well as continue to increase through calendar year 25. Uh, we are continuing to work on increasing our capacity and making good progress uh, with respect to capacity as well as overall yield and uh, quality. So certainly, you know, in uh, calendar year 25 versus calendar year 24, given that we are just starting our production here now, will certainly be a significant growth over our uh, calendar year 24 uh, numbers. And you can look at it same way for fiscal 24 versus 25. So it will be definitely a significant increase with us. So big rebound for Micron in their business and suggesting things are going to get better, uh, particularly driven by what's happening in the data center right now. Absolutely. Seems exciting. All right, well, I'm going to drink into what's going on in the biotech world. Uh, biotechs have had a lousy year in the market, uh, including not being able to do IPOs. But we've had a, a really big IPO from a company called Caverna Therapeutics. Not a big IPO, but the fact there was any IPO at all in biotech shows you how strong uh, the prospects are for this company. Because it's treating some incurable diseases like lupus and possibly multiple sclerosis. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the interesting treatment, the interesting way they've derived this treatment for these autoimmune diseases with the CEO, Peter Mag, right after this. The Drill Down is brought to you by ERA. Never miss another critical event or insight ever. With ERA, customize your company watch list and track key events, mentions, filings, and more, all within an easy-to-use, customizable interface. That's ERA, A-I-E-R-A, dot -E com. All right, we're joined right now by the Caverna uh, Therapeutics CEO, Peter Mag, uh, uh, and Peter, glad to have you on, not least of which because your last company I was a shareholder in. Um, uh, and, and that did quite well by me, although I sold way too early. I don't know what's going to happen with your stock right now. But as I always tell the listeners, I don't care about your stock. I care about your business. And what an interesting company this is. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, Caverna Therapeutics is focusing on patients with autoimmune disease. I'm fascinated by patients that have complex immunological issues. You mentioned CareDx. These are transplantation patients. And now medicine has the next 30 years of focusing on patients with autoimmune disease with cell therapy. So, so, so glad to be on and talking about Caverna. Yeah, I want to, uh, it, it was interesting doing the research on this because I, I, you know, what I, my knowledge of, of, biotech uh, companies and, and chemistry and everything else is pathetic. Uh, and yet when I study these companies, they only approach them uh, as, as financial instruments, which is also useless information. Um, I think what you guys are doing, uh, so I wanna talk about, I wanna start with the patient experience and what you found in some of the phase one trials, because some of the stories, some of the human stories of suffering and illness, and, and I know we don't like to use the word cure, but the, but the results of your treatment, Give me uh, some of the examples of what happened in your phase one trials. What the, what, and I want to start with what the patients went through when they got sick and then what happened when they started your treatments. You know, autoimmune diseases are de debilitating diseases. Um, it's a very, very large opportunity. About 8 to 10 percent of Americans suffer from some form of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease can be, you know, psoriasis, can be rheumatoid arthritis, but it can also be multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis and lupus nephritis. And so many, many of these diseases are caused by your cells are creating autoantibodies. And instead of fighting off foreign tissue, they're fighting their own tissue. And that is destructing own tissue or own organs and has debilitating effects on many of these patients over many, many, many years. Um, these patients live for a very long period of time and suffer through chronic disease management. Now with Kyverna, we have now a promise of using an established technology that has been revolutionizing blood cancers and apply it to, this, to the face of autoimmune disease. 
And, uh, you know, the first patients that we have treated in myasthenia gravis, some of those patients that have had years and years of experience with autoimmune disease from a wheelchair within walking again within 60 days. So it's really a, a, a potentially game changing technology based on genetic engineering, which is an amazing technology as we apply this to, to medicine. And not to over dramatize it, but I'm, I'm picturing the life of a perfectly healthy person whose immune system just suddenly turns against them and it starts with aches and pains and then begins uh, debilitating pain, pain and then they end up in a hospital and then they end up in a wheelchair with no hope of treatment uh, for the rest of their lives. Now, th these patients do, ha do have treatments, but these are immune suppressives, they're heavy steroids, they are, and they're all leading to a very slow decline in some of these patients that many of these treatments are not effective. The monoclonal antibodies um, have been providing some relief for some patients, but there are many, many patients where even monoclonal antibodies or biologics are not sufficient, and they're refractory to all these patients, to all these treatments. So with a cell therapy, we have that potential to maybe reset the immune system. And this reset of the immune system, I always compare it to when I grew up, I had to reset, push the reset button to my computer. I never knew what caused the computer to crash, but you push the reset button, it restarts and reboots, and the computer is doing well for quite some time. And that's what we promise with resetting the immune system by rebooting your, your, your immune system to alleviate that, that issue that you're basically creating yourself by creating autoantibodies. And yet you chose to call the company Caverna, not Control-Alt-Delete? Because it sounds like that's what you're talking about. Uh, you know, this morning somebody said uh, Skyverna is the limit. So putting an S in front of Caverna, <laughs> Skyverna is the limit. I, you know, I think this we are in front of the next 30 years of medicine uh, with now, I think there are two fundamental technologies that are are profoundly changing the next generation. One is artificial intelligence, for sure. And the other one is genetic engineering. We're now able to change cells to a way that they identify your bad B cells and you eliminate these bad B cells that are creating these autoantibodies very targeted. And the Kyberna technology is just, just to, does that. You're, you're using your own cells and, and then we change them. And so we reinfuse these cells to you, your own cells, slightly modified, and then those are targeting the bad B cells. And that leads to potentially the immune reset. How tailored does it have to be for the particular indication? And that's the magic of the technology. You know, these B cells are creating autoantibodies, and we're just depleting all B cells for a short window of time. And in the multiple sclerosis, I, as I mentioned, all these different autoimmune diseases have one thing in common. Probably your B cells are the culprit of creating these autoantibodies that are creating these, these issues with these tissues. And by depleting B cells, we might have an application to many, many different autoimmune diseases, which is phenomenal. It's relatively the same technology that can be applied to a wide range of, of, of uh, indications. So um, why start, how do you choose what to start with and, and, and what's, I mean, obviously you got some uh, special approval by the FDA to get to market quickly. Is that part of the calculus? Yes, I think there are two areas that we are laser shop focused on. What gets us quickest to market to prove the concept and also prove to the world that this the regulatory pathway is to be established in autoimmune disease, CAR T cell therapy. But the other one is what's the biggest opportunity? And the biggest opportunity that I see is multiple sclerosis. There are so many patients, as you had mentioned, uh, Corey, that are going worse and worse and worse. Um, I have in my life a few individuals that I follow through an MS indicate diagnosis, and over the years I've really withered away. Um, and that's, you know, MS is this big market opportunity also as a company that will get us very excited as, as a business because, you know, this is such a vast opportunity in many indications, but multiple sclerosis making a big impact in, in this patient population would be tremendous, not only from the patient benefit, but also from a commercial opportunity. What's your timing with these, uh, the trials you're in right now and then what happens? 
You know, Corey, we just went public about eight weeks ago, a very exciting um, um, a biotech startup um, uh, becoming a publicly quoted, quoted with KYTX. But the, the opportunity, I think, leads to demonstrating the efficacy in this patient population. I had shared, we have now dosed the first 20 patients. We're still very early in the process, so it be, needs to be considered experimental. But the effect that we have seen is dramatic, is amazing. To many of these patients, it's really a game changer for these patients. Um, a single investigator has treated one patient uh, almost 1,000 days out now. So three years, roughly, this patient is completely free of all medications. And so we are in the early innings. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm navigating around answering your question because we're in this early phase. I'm used to it. And really, <laughs> and really negotiating with the FDA and uh, also having a good interaction with clinicians, where do we see the patient population that will benefit the most and what gets us to approval quickest is right now the focus. You've also talked in some interviews about, uh, and your company has, uh, to also other people at the company have talked about, um, changing the way that this uh, is delivered, that um, somehow you know, taking the, the very cumbersome process of autoimmune therapy and, and making it sort of basically changing out the blood in a more uh, efficacious manner. Yeah, and you know, the technology was or originally established in, onco in an oncology setting. And in oncology, it's really you want the therapy to be receiving yesterday. And, uh, you know, cost is not an issue. So you focus on what you can do really quickly. And that has led to having a 1Z, 2Z type of approach to manufacturing. And we think we can which, really which change is to say, the Let's see if we can describe that even, which is a, a big machine sitting next to a patient that takes the, a, a lot of blood out uh, runs it through some elaborate processes with essentially a dishwasher sitting right next to the or a blood washer sitting right next to the patient to try to get them that 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 that, that different blood coming back into their system that's been uh, had uh, some of those autoimmune CAR T cells swapped out, if you will. Am I, am I oversimplifying that? No, I think. I mean, you know, yes, the is the answer, but. The answer is you're you're maybe oversimplifying, but the, it's a cumbersome process. Um, initially, in order to get your cells out, it takes eight hours. It's you have to sit in a chair. It's very cumbersome, and then you wait for two for two to four weeks, and then you get your 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 modified cells back. Um, so this entire patient experience that takes weeks and weeks and is very cumbersome, we maybe be, be able to revolutionize it in autoimmune disease because the volume is changing. I sometimes joke that we, you know, we now need to invent the conveyor belt for CAR T cell manufacturing because right now it is done by on a single patient basis, uh, very cumbersome with multiple steps. Maybe we can automize, aut automize um, minimize and digitize the process to a level that it is also suitable for autoimmune disease patients to also make it cost effective. I think that's very important that we have the business value proposition in mind that if we want to treat that many patients, we need to make it affordable for many of these patients to also have access to these medications. Yeah. Um, so where is that part of this process or is that a separate process, a separate project? Are they related in any way in terms of time to market? No, absolutely. It's focused on, you know, I shared with you the largest opportunity is multiple sclerosis. By the time that we have, we're launching this commercially, we believe that we will have a solution available that's, for example, not based on this very cumbersome aphoresis eight hours process, but we can do this with a simple blood draw. And with many of these components that we will change, we'll be able to deliver this at a very, very different price point with also a very different time to uh, time to infusion. So I think, you know, we're in the midst of a revolutionization of CAR T cell manufacturing as well. Kyverna is not the only company that is working on that, but we are now in the benefit of having learned from 10 years of investment in oncology and now apply to this to an autoimmune disease setting with what I would say we're moving from a two-seater sports car to a four-door sedan type thing where we are now going mass market. Now you're based in Emeryville, California, tucked for those not in the know, tucked in the the Berkeley, Oakland area, right right across the uh, the Bay Bridge from San Francisco, and of course on the San Francisco side where I'm sitting right now in the San Francisco Ferry Building, uh, all the excitements about AI. There's all this talk about kind of digital technology, semiconductors, things that we have seen before in computer technology, and I wonder what it's like 
to be sitting in Emeryville and, and reading in the, in the Wall Street Journal every day about AI, not so much about um, this, this revolution in, in uh, genetic therapies? You know, I'm old enough that I know that these waves go up and down and the pendulum is swinging. I think AI is here to stay and will profoundly impact how we're interacting with machines and how we interact with between humans. But then there's genetic engineering that will allow us to solve many of the problems, especially many of the diseases that we have been encountering. So I think genetic engineering um, and cell therapy is an element of genetic engineering will profoundly change how we're thinking about autoimmune disease. Now, being in Emeryville, you're, I feel very privileged to be somewhere between Stanford and UCSF and all this ecosystem of Silicon Valley. As a serial entrepreneur, it's an exciting environment where we have access to talent, where we have access to capital, and we have access to technology. Uh, I feel, you know, I'm, you see it by my smile. I, I, it's, it's an amazing environment and ecosystem where we can attract the smartest minds in the people, in, in, the, in the industry and attract them to Kyberna. Yeah, it's an interesting time. There was, there was a time where the Bay Area really um, was unique in that it ha was the only place that had the kind of the banking, legal, risk, um, uh, and academic infrastructure that led to startups both in technology and in, in uh, biotech and, strangely, in restaurants as well. Um, uh, and you saw a lot of those companies going public and the firms that were based on here that are long gone, like Montgomery Securities and Hamburg and Quist and so on, spot Robertson Stevens sponsoring those kinds of companies. And yet you still have that kind of startup uh, ethos here that I think is unparalleled anywhere in the world still. Absolutely. And, you know, I see that in my own kids, they're drawn back into the Bay Area out of Boston and L.A. And they think of this ecosystem being very unique as they're building their careers. If you're thinking about where do you want to live in the world, um, this is a unique spot where we are attracting capital, attracting technology and attracting talent. Now, there are other places in the world that are also very attractive, but, you know, given where we are here in the Bay Area, I need to look outside of the window and I know exactly where I want to live. Um, come on in, the water's warm. I mean, the water's cold, but you know, come on in, the water's warm. Oh, sorry. That's like the Bay Area uh, Booster Society, <laughs> you and me. Uh, Peter, glad to have you. Uh, Kyverna Therapeutics, Peter Mag, uh, joining us here on the Drill Down podcast. Thank you so much for having me on and think about Caverna and patients with autoimmune disease. A big thank you to all these patients that are allowing us to learn and apply our technology, potentially changing their lives. Thank you. Indeed. All right. Coming up next, The Bite, one number that tells us a whole lot more about Kyverna Therapeutics. Right after this. The Drill Down is brought to you by Futurum Group, where analysts, researchers, advisors, content creators, and marketing experts help business leaders anticipate and understand shifts in their industries and build strategies to leverage disruptive innovation. With deep analysis, Futurum Group's extensive industry experience delivers reliable research and data thought leadership, and actionable advice to help you with your strategy and go-to-market efforts. Futurum Group. All right, we're back with the drill down. We've got the bite, one number that tells us a whole lot. Uh, ben Wilson with us as well. So, Ben, um, uh, the number is five. Five. Five, because five patients were treated in a phase one trial by Caverna Therapeutics, uh, what they're calling CD19. Um, and it's a T cell therapy, as we were discussing, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a small test, as I said, phase one. But uh, of all five patients that they tested who are suffering from systemic lupus erythematosus, easy for me to say, otherwise known as SLE, um, SLE affects three to 22,000 people. They found five of those people, tested this drug on those five people, and all five saw positive results uh, and relief for the underlying disease lupus, which of course is incurable. So um, that reason alone uh, got a lot of excitement going on around Caverna um, and leads to the suggestion that their treatments could help a lot of other things in the future. That's great, yeah, small sample size, but 100% success rate, that's kind of nice. Indeed, all right, thanks for listening to The Drill Down. I'm Corey Johnson, thanks for Ben Wilson, our fabulous co-host, and of course our editor extraordinaire. The Drill Down's a production of 6.5 Media.